Taylor, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Justin. I'm super excited to be here. Yes, always excited to talk about Toucan. What you guys are doing is so unique, uh, so special, obviously helping a lot of people and seeing even the growth on on Twitter, you kind of building in public and sharing your growth numbers is is exciting. And, and for people though who don't know Toucan, what is this company doing today, Taylor? Yeah, so Toucan is a free browser extension that you install into the web. So then as you're on TechCrunch, Reddit, Twitter, we serve you up with micro moments of learning to help you learn a new language by immersing you. So what that looks like is the word coffee may be in a New York Times article. We swap that out for cafe and through contacts, your brain does the magic and helps you learn that new language. Yeah, and for context for this thing, I mean, this is, people know browser extensions, they've seen this, but having seen the product like myself when I've used it before, it's so easy. It's so easy to go through and you just kind of, oh, you see all these words that pop up and everything. Where did the idea for this even come from, Taylor? I'm curious. Yeah, so all three of us co-founders, we've worked in some of the best consumer tech companies here in Los Angeles. Um, Headspace being one of them, where we were some of the earliest employees, also Riot Games and Prey and Fair. And through all of these experiences, we learned how hard it was to steal even 10 minutes out of people's very busy days, right? Because time is so hard to take from people because you're not just competing against friends, family, work, and school, but also Netflix, Spotify, TikTok, Clubhouse, everything and anything. So with Toucan, when we started thinking about education and asking the question, how do we get people to learn, but also learn every single day something new, we decided we can't compete for time. Um, so with Toucan, we decided let's intentionally layer on top of the existing people behaviors, meet people where they already are throughout the flow of their day. And that's how we landed on a browser extension as our first product vertical. And and for us, you know, at Vitalize, investing in different companies, we're looking at early stage, we're always looking for kind of that founder product or founder market fit. For you and your team, like why an education product? I'm curious. Yes. Um, so many reasons around education, like education is something that we are so passionate about as individuals, especially languages. Like that is the thing that not only creates relationships, human empathy from humans to humans, and is also a human universal need, but lifts people out of poverty, like does massive things and the ripple effects that this could have on the world was huge. Like we've always been mission driven founders that looks at, okay, we can build a massive business that we intend to return a lot to the funds that invest in us, but also this will do a lot of good in the world. And, and to that point too. So with this, when you had this idea for it, you know, you're going to do a browser extension. How do you get the word out? How did you start to actually get the distribution, figure out what channels you wanted to use? Because as startup founders, there are so many options. People are going to think Facebook and Instagram. There can be some organic routes. Like, How did you choose to get distribution for uh, Toucan initially? Yeah. And even with the first version of Toucan 2, it was so ugly. It was beautiful. And it was a terrible user experience to start. If you can imagine the word the being translated every single time you see it on the web into Spanish, terrible. But we wanted to initially like do things that don't scale. In the pre-COVID world, we went to coffee shops, got strangers to install Toucan, saw how they used it, asked them questions. And there was magic there even just from those moments and got a bunch of user feedback from that. And very early times too, we were started to grow just word of mouth by us getting these strangers to install Toucan, they actually told their friends and colleagues about Toucan to install it even with that terrible user experience. Um, but once we started gravitating, like, okay, we need to find other channels. Um, that's where Twitter became one of our first really um, great channels for growth. I started, I created a Twitter account. I never had one, I never used it. Um, and just started tweeting just once a day and probably was talking to myself most of that beginning parts. Um, but then slowly but surely started um, getting people to engage back, talk to me, which also helped on the growth side as well as the user feedback side for quick iteration. Okay, I want to dive deeper into that because I know Twitter, I've, I've followed along and I've seen your, your Twitter following grow. I've seen you post all the time. How do you think about that? I mean, how has that evolved since, you know, you start an account and then you're like, no one's really watching or reading your tweets yet. And to now, you have like 10,000 some followers or something. Um, and seems like a lot of engagement. 
how are you thinking through that as a founder, how to leverage this channel where so many people are at, so many people who want to learn are curious and everything. How are you leveraging that channel or thinking about leveraging that on a strategic side of things? Yeah. So strategically through growth and user feedback rate, product iteration. Um, what I know that I can commit to is just one tweet a day. And so I try to make that happen. Like very low bar, um, but it, it's consistency. And I think that proves, and then not only the consistency part, but for anyone engaging with me, I'm going to engage back to build that relationship, build an audience and like user love with Toucan because as the founder CEO, I'm, I'm engaging with our users, which is pretty rare um, for just products in general. And I think people notice that. And that also builds an affinity to Toucan, helps us with referrals, also gives us such invaluable feedback for our product that has helped us make Toucan to what it is today. So when you're, you're saying that, like what, what types of things then would you tweet around getting feedback or around like what, what in general? Because I'm just trying to think of other founders who may want to use Twitter. And I know a number of founders, like one of my friends, Laura, she's just got on Twitter as well, actually, uh, for her company and her con consumer company. And I know she'll be thinking like, what should I even tweet? People even wonder like how to use this channel. One tweet a day, I love the minimum. I think it's great to set something like that as a starting point. Like what it goes in that in terms of like what you're actually going to tweet are things that are most helpful to tweet as the founder of a company. Yeah. So I tend to tweet about what's most top of mind, like what's happening on top of mind for me that day, that week. And um, one of them even today was like, we're thinking about what does a Slack bot for Toucan look like? So I was like, if we, like thousands of workers use Toucan during the workday, like what a, would a Toucan Slack bot look like? And got so many good ideas and feedback. So I think ideas around like what to build, features. Also, we'll share out designs for what we're building before it's even within our product and get feedback. Like, what does this look like? How does this feel? And then the third one is milestones like user milestones, growth milestones, just trying to be transparent about that. And these three are very much like either neutral or very positive. And I try to like weave in some too with the realities of being a founder, like the ups and the downs because there are crazy highs and lows. And being real with that, I think helps other founders realize they're not alone in that crazy journey. Like we're all going through it. Yeah. And that's like something like, you know, having done almost 300 interviews total so far, you, I hear so much about these different journeys of founders in any stage. I mean, founders who have gone on to raise hundreds of millions of dollars, like they all go through a lot of different downs along the way. Obviously there's some wins and some ups there as well. And what you mentioned too, with how you're sharing that on Twitter, it reminds me of Indie Hackers, uh, the community around people sharing their milestones and sharing how they're kind of going about building solo businesses mostly. Um, but it's so fascinating to see that community and see how that grows and how people are encouraged by that to be like, Hey, I hit my first 200 users, 300 users or like thousand in revenue, whatever. And like people are encouraged, but also then it's like, oh, I can start something. I can do this. And it makes it more real to your point of like the founder CEO tweeting about something and like talking about your company, like, oh, I want to like learn more about that company versus something that's just like corporate and just like some nameless, faceless thing. It's totally different. Exactly. There's the human element and it's all about relationships at the end of the day. And probably the most infamous or famous about it is Elon, like Elon Musk, like one of the fast CEOs in the world, very active on Twitter, um, probably wouldn't go as extreme as him sometimes, but like he is very active and he's building like people who are very passionate about him and what he's building because he'll tweet random memes or things about him as an individual or what they're working on and giving people an inside glimpse um, behind just the corporate branding, the corporate speak. Yeah. I think there's something big to that, especially now as you kind of just have to see how things evolve over time. And and one thing I want to go back to is obviously we mentioned what the product does. So it's in the browser. People are going through words pop up in different languages. They can learn. You can kind of hover over it and see different things. You can click on it as well. What are the challenges around kind of monitoring? Are people actually learning? How do you change the words so people learn? I want to know, like, would love to know more about that side of things too. Yes, the efficacy piece of learning is something really, really important to us, um, even when we had the idea, right? Because there is so much research around 
immersion and space repetition and contextual immersion, comprehensible input, you name it. I, all the science back techniques that we're doing that's researched since the 70s, um, but there has never been a tool like Toucan that exists. And as founders, it was a very similar jump that we had to make at Headspace, right? Because there was so much research about around meditation, but not yet Headspace as a tool for meditation. Um, so we're in the similar process. But what's very unique about Toucan is you can visually see your progress as a user, right? You might come in, words and phrases sprinkled here and there. In six months from you starting, your page may be 75% of the way covered up. The other thing we also do is slowly but surely try to progress you around um, different words and phrases. So for instance, if you see the word coffee translated in line, if you've seen it around 75 times, or if you tell us you know this or test out of it through our quizzes, we'll start um, giving you collocations, which is two words together. So introducing hot coffee or cold coffees, so you can understand gender and pluralization. Then after you've mastered that, we might give you a phrase or a small little sentence for grammar structure, verbs, and so on. So you're naturally picking up more complex aspects of languages without really even noticing it because it's so passive and subliminal. It's it's so unique to be able to do that. And to that point of what you're actually doing the product side, I mean, I'm sure it's very complicated. Explaining that to investors, you have a number of Great investors, I'll say, obviously, on, on the cap table, uh, not to do anyone's horn at all. But with that, how did you explain that? How did you walk people through that in terms of your investors around this is something so new and so different? How did you pitch that in the early days? I'm, I'm really curious about that. Yeah, and it's like the newness from a learning perspective, but also from a consumer behavior perspective, right? Because so many investors um, and are looking at the metrics of like, active engagement, like how much time are you taking out a day? We're with people five hours a day. And we have that permission because we are passive and subliminal. And we lean in when our users tell us to lean in. And we lean out when they tell us to lean out. Um, and it's a very different way of thinking about consumer behavior because it's not active as much and it's more passive side. But there's still so much learning benefits around it. And I think what we've um, gathered as we've been building Toucan is really getting good at communicating those benefits and that story. And it's taken a while for us to be able to do that because there's had to be a lot of education because it's so new. And first taking this step back for us as a team to really understand the power of Toucan, like diving into all of the white papers, all of the research talking to the professors, the PhD students that have done all of the research, and then figuring out how do we distill all this information and now communicate it back to investors so that they can really understand it. So that we're now the experts in these topics, but also that it's really exciting because it is honestly cutting edge to a certain extent because there has never been this augmented layer of learning that existed on the web. And with that as well, then, what, what was some of the feedback you were getting early on then from, from the investors you were talking to? I mean, were, <laughs> other investors, were they saying like, oh, I get it right away? I'm sure some were like, no, like this is, I don't, I don't know what this is. Like, what was some of that feedback you were getting? Yeah. In the early days, it was definitely like, okay, browser extension, but what's your mobile strategy? <laughs> uh, like mobile, 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 not really understanding the power of extensions and web. Like our thesis for Toucan is to meet people where they are. So mobile naturally extends into that that thesis and we'll get there and not just mobile, but also the physical world and AR, you name it. Um, but the power of extensions and being on a web-based platform are so massive. And the entire extension ecosystem is completely overlooked and untapped. And so that even that piece, I had to do a lot of education over because if you look at the two biggest extensions, Honey, $4 billion exit, as well as Grammarly printing hundreds of millions of dollars every year, they didn't have a chance for like early stage investors didn't really look at them, right? Because Grammarly bootstrapped for 10 years and then raised a hundred million dollar round. And Honey like initially tried to fundraise, but couldn't because investors didn't really understand it. So they just became profitable and then set their own path forward. And so Toucan was one of the first times that investors were looking at an early stage browser first product that also was in education and language learning. 
Yeah. What? How crazy is that? I know one of the co-founders, I want to say it was one of the co-founders of Honey came in to speak in the MBA class at USC. And they, they talked about those struggles early on. Like no one got it. No one understood what they were doing and they couldn't see the value of it. And then obviously the people who did bet on them did really well and it helped a lot with the LA ecosystem of startups uh, to have Honey have such a massive exit. But it's opening the door for more ways to learn. Obviously, you're proving that with with Toucan as well. And on that note of mobile, we had that as one of the Twitter questions around like, that seems like a challenge to execute mobile for your existing product. Like, how are you thinking through that? How do you plan to tackle that? Where does that even come into play? Because I mean, one thing at a time, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm curious though, how are you thinking about mobile anyways? Yeah, so you're spot on. Like, there's so much opportunity for Toucan, like new product verticals, new content verticals. And so what we've really is is this, Focus is key for us, like Toucan to dominate the web, like Chrome first. We're about to launch Safari. Uh, next week it goes live, then Firefox Edge. So we'll be across every extension ecosystem. Then that gives us the ability to be like, we've proved out this completely new consumer behavior and people love Toucan. Now let's look to mobile because we're with people five hours a day as they're browsing the web. Now let's be with them another five hours as they're using their mobile devices, which is really cool to be able to do. So we have mobile browsing, right? As well as layering on top of the most popular social apps, messaging apps, like doing direct partnerships with these developers, strategically bringing on investors that can help us form these partnerships that we're already speaking with, um, but then bringing Toucan on top of mobile. And we've had an amazing like reach out from um, mobile device like carriers and browsers already trying to bring Toucan into to the browser ecosystem on mobile, but it's just a matter of, matter of timing for us. Yeah, and you, yeah, I can only do so much. Obviously, as a startup, there's uh, a thousand different things that are taking your attention or vying for your attention at all times. And one of the things I'm curious about is with with an ed tech, you know, future of learning type of company. How are you thinking about then relationships with institutions, relationships with other you know tech companies that can have this educational component, whether it be even like companies on their onboarding or hiring or things around their employees? Like, how do you think of those partnerships that could potentially be you know big contracts or whatever for for Toucan versus obviously using the extension and going direct to consumer? How do you think about those those types of things as well? B two B is huge for awesome like massive potential and we've had a ton of inbound heat already and i think b2c companies tend to naturally go to b2b at some point in their life cycle right and at headspace we were b2c to start and then i started playing around with our b2b like product business unit before we even had a b2b product it was like me coding up landing pages putting on logos of these companies and then selling it into the orgs and with toucan also education as well as the workforce. Like I never realized how big Chromebooks are across the education system. They are everywhere. I never had one in school, but they are all over the place and extensions play a big role in that. And so that's another potential for Toucan. And at the district level, pre-installing Toucan, giving students access to our premium um, subscription and then the workforce. like. Work is now global. Like if your employees are not global, you might have clients or customers or people you want to talk to that live in other countries around the world. Not only that, learning a language helps with inclusion and everything that people are trying to connect, create that human empathy moment, which the workforce should and is trying to help um, do, which is a great employee benefit, right? Um, be able to learn Spanish as you're working throughout your day anyways. Yeah, that's, it is such a huge benefit to have that sort of thing. And on that note of kind of the work side of things with your team at Toucan, building this startup, building this team, how has that gone for you? What's been helpful for you along the way in this new world of distributed workforces and everything? What's been helpful or most helpful for you along the lines of building your team? Because that's a huge part of any startup, obviously. Yeah, so we've now scaled Toucan to 12 full-time employees. Um, it's been very exciting. I also consider hiring one of our superpowers, which I'm very proud of, um, and as well as like building a really great place to work where people are not just their work, but also humans too. And having that balance of like speed, need to work fast because we're in a high growth startup, but also people have lives outside of work and being very mindful, intentional about that, intentional about burnout and everything that goes around with it. Um, and I think since we've been thinking about it for day, 
since day one. And we're also operators ourselves. Like it's something we knew we wanted to build into the culture and that we set as an example as leaders. And then we also have adapted to the remote like life and workforce that we do such fun things, um, even very simple things, right? But that makes such a difference. Like Fridays, one of our amazing engineers, he loves this, so we let him lead it. He picks a question every Friday to get to know your like colleagues better. Like, what is your favorite food or where do you want to travel after the pandemic? And everyone changes their Slack name to the answer. So it creates a little entropy because you're trying to find who you're trying to talk to, but you also get that moment of learning something new about your colleague. Um, we even have something fun at our daily standup. Um, we have a like a kudos toucan, which we all have. You can see in my background these little yes, yeah, <laughs> little stuffed toucans. And at the end of standup, whoever got it the day before can give kudos publicly to whoever they want on the team. It's like saying thank you, giving them props. Or whatever they did and then the next day they give it to the next person whoever they want yeah finding some way to build that camaraderie with with a team especially in this environment of, of distributed work is is a challenge and everyone kind of has, has different opinions on that so it's, it's kind of fascinating to hear how people approach that side of things and then even going more granular on that so you mentioned you have daily stand-ups that's one thing i'm curious about i want to dive deeper into like how how you structure your week as a team or like does like each person have check-ins with their their direct report? Like, how do you manage that side of things? Because um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. I'm just curious for you at Toucan, obviously a fast-growing startup here. How are you deciding to do that? I'm curious. So relationships are everything. And that's one of the reasons why we have a daily stand-up at, together as a team. And actually, the first part of it is us just pretty much messing around, learning about each other. What are you doing? What's happening? What are you watching on Netflix? Different things happening in people's lives to create that a moment of almost being around a water cooler. And then we dive into more of the company announcements. So leaving space for that. And then all of the managers have uh, one-on-ones with their team every week on a weekly basis. And so they're having that check-in as well as sprint planning that happens on Mondays at the start of the week and also backlog grooming to go over different tickets in JIRA, clean things up, make sure everything's prepped for that next sprint that we go after. Um, But honestly, besides that, we try to stick to as little meetings as possible. Let people execute, do their work, um, slack each other if they have questions, but there's no reason to have back-to-back-to-back meetings or make all the team do that because that's valuable hours that they could be otherwise spent doing other things. Yeah, and one more thing on the, on the team side of things as well. So with growing your team, you mentioned 12, 12 employees now. Uh, and I'm sure that will continue to grow, obviously, as, as you grow then. How do you look at like internal, work your networks for people, leverage VCs to get their contacts versus, you know, like recruiting firms can be expensive, but they can also be really fast. Like, how have you thought through that side of things? And is that evolving, changing as you're growing? So this piece is really key to me, right? Because we could work our networks, which we have, but we always pair that with us being doing things that don't scale. Like we didn't haven't necessarily used recruit, recruiting firms, but I, I consider myself a professional stalker, but in the least creepy way possible, like reaching out to people on LinkedIn, adding them, not sending a note because notes are creepy on LinkedIn, having them accept me. I could have guessed their work email. I'm sure 100% I would have gotten it, but I don't necessarily want to send a recruiting email to someone's work email. But on LinkedIn, everyone signs up with their personal email. So by them accepting me, I can grab their personal email, then send them an email, right? To add different people, more diverse candidates into our hiring pipeline. Because if we just worked at our network and people we know, that's where everyone gets in trouble in tech, right? That's how... Everyone looks the same if you look at someone's, right, Um, someone's team page because you're moving so fast. Hiring and taking time to do that takes time, right? And when you're trying to go fast, doesn't necessarily, working your own network is easier. It's the easier option. But we've always been heads up and took that time to go beyond that. Like have me who probably has to do a lot of other things, but like, this is something so important to us, not just building amazing culture, but also having diverse culture with amazing team members that are not just culture fit, but culture add 
like we're adding to everything, not just trying to fit into the mold. Yeah, I I love that. That's something that's been echoed a few different times on when I've interviewed people around that. It's like, how does this improve? How does this add to what we're doing already? And it's not like it has to fit into what we're we're currently doing, but like add to what we're doing moving forward as well um, along those lines. And with that too, so that's, you mentioned kind of how you can work with your team and everything as well. Like you're the CEO, how are you spending your time? What does that look like on a week-to-week basis for other founders out there wondering how this whole entrepreneurship thing works and like how someone at a fast growing tech company spends their time? What does it look like for you, Taylor? Yeah. And this may change too, as we keep scaling. Um, If I'm fundraising, it's one of my key roles as a CEO. Like I am a hundred percent fundraising. Like I definitely lean on my other two co-founders to take care of the company, check-ins, even my direct reports. Like that is my focus a hundred percent, go execute and then come back and build the business with the team. Um, If I'm not fundraising, that's really where I'm focused on hiring like culture team, as well as growth. Like growth is my specialty. Distribution, how do we scale Toucan without paid acquisition, really interesting channels, distribution plays. Um, That's my bread and butter and really how I complement my two co-founders too. And so that's how I split my time. And then even if we just look at at a day schedule for me, I block out my mornings. Like I do not have any meetings in my mornings and I'm pretty ruthless about that. Because that is where I do my best work. And then I leave the rest of the day open if I need to have external meetings, talk to people, do anything on press, PR, partnerships, um, to really do things in co- collaboration with other people. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great way to structure the day. And I found pr- a pretty similar schedule typically. I prefer to do the kind of deep work stuff, especially like through creative work, side up things for, for Vitalize. A lot of that work gets done typically in the morning. Same with the other stuff with Just Go Grind podcast. All of that creative work, I tend to do a lot of that like editing and like more like thinking through that side of things earlier. And then in the afternoon, some of those other things around, again, like interviews and those types of things as well. I think every founder has to figure out where they're optimal. I always tell people like managing your energy, not necessarily just your time. It's like when do you have the most energy for certain tasks? And if you find out when that is, then you can kind of adjust things. Because for me, like I get energy from doing these calls, doing interviews, like that gives me a lot of energy. So naturally in the afternoons or later on when I'm losing it and it's, it's falling off, then you get a boost again when you talk to people and you hear about Toucan, for instance, and what you guys are doing. It's another exciting thing there that I think is just really helpful for people as well. And Going back to that point of like the two main things you're doing, one being the distribution, two being the investors and kind of uh, fundraising. I know from your last fundraise, at least when you closed your seed, it closed in like three weeks, which is incredibly quick um, for founders out there. Like I've talked to other founders who have closed in like six to 10 months. Like it's it can be a long, a long process, a slog. Take me through how that came together so fast because I think other founders would find that useful. Yeah. So something I did strategically um, when we first started to cap is starting to build those relationships. So I I mentioned our very ugly MVP when we first had it, that also if you probably installed it, we broke your computer at that point. Um, Not to that extent, but um, I started meeting with even Series A investors, like not even just pre-seed seed, but also Series A, because I knew that building relationships is really key. Um, If someone saw me sharing the, the big vision of Toucan and what this could be, But then six months from then saw me executing on every single thing that I said and more. That conversation then when I would want to go out to raise capital becomes easier. They know me now as a person. They know what we're building. They saw us execute to have like little dots um, around them. And that also helps speeds up conversations in general. And then when I knew I wanted to go out to raise capital, don't recommend this to everyone, but how I structure my fundraise is I have meetings back to back to back. And why this is so hard is like you mentioned managing your energy it could be really hard for a founder because especially early on, people are betting on you as a team and really the idea more than anything. So if someone is really critical, you kind of take it to heart more than others. But every meeting is so different, right? Where you could, it could go so well, you're on such a high. The next meeting could be so terrible, you're so far low. But you have to get to that next meeting still at neutral because it's a completely blank slate. You have a whole new opportunity on your, hand, your hands. But by doing it back to back, it allows, allowed me to create momentum 
and get conversations moving faster than doing one here this week, one there that week, trickling it in here and there while I'm also building and doing a lot of other things. Yeah, that's a lot to handle. And even there's something to be said too with that, uh, what is it called? Like, it's like task residue of like switching tasks. It's always so hard to switch between different types of tasks. If you're constantly task switching, it can drain you even more. So even though in some ways it'd be draining to do that many meetings back to back, it might've been best, obviously, if you found it worked really well for you, because then you're still in that same mode. Like, at least you're still in the same mode of pitching. And you're, you've done it before. So you're not like, oh, I'm on this high. And then like this lull of no meeting and stuff like that. So I think that's that's helpful to hear that side of things as well. And on that note too, I mean, with the investors you had on, like like Baron Davis, Wonder Ventures, Halogen, obviously Vitalize and a number of other ones. How are you targeting that in terms of who you're approaching and who you want to have on that cap table? Um, there's always a mix of, you know, one, you need, you need capital, but you can be strategic with that as well. How did you approach it from that side of things as to who you want on your cap table at Seacan? Yeah. So a few different things here. Um, first, of course, I use just plain old Google Docs of creating my own CRM there, um, starting first with founders. So started first meeting with founders, um, getting into the groove of telling the story of Toucan. Also, other venture back founders know what questions investors are going to ask. So it can start helping me get in that rhythm, find out holes in my story, really iterate on that whole pitch and then would ask them for warm intros. Now, once I would get the warm intros to VCs, I would not take the meeting right then. I would actually ask to push that meeting out two months from then, whenever I wanted to start my fundraise. And that's how I was able to set my schedule exactly how I wanted to um, versus being at someone else's schedule. And I would also always send out the calendar invite because investors tend not to like set, sending out calendar invites anyways, but also allows me to put people where I want, want them. Um, but with investors, like when speaking with founders too, you'll get a handful of investor intros, always research them, like what type of fund are they? What stage, what, what check size, because there is math that needs to make sense of whether they can even invest in you or not. And then also doing your research of like, are they a lead investor? Are they a follow on investor? You really need to nail down that lead before you bring on follow on capital too. So you want that term sheet that then sets the terms for other investors to come in. And in the, there's always that serendipity moment too, that I think founders should be aware of, of I did not know Baron Davis. He is an amazing two-time MBA all-star and he found us on Twitter. Um, but that wasn't an introduction I was actively seeking. It happened serendipitously, um, but making room for that within my calendar to make sure I'm able to take introductions or speak to people that I didn't plan for. Um, and I think it's worth noting that our lead investor at that C, GSV Ventures, I did not know GSV. They were not on my list to start with. And they were an intro from an investor that we knew in Los Angeles. We knew they weren't a great fit for us. And they're like, you have to talk to GSV, GSV, GSV. And they're like, okay, yeah, I'll take the intro. And then they ended up being our lead and such a perfect fit for us, such a perfect investor. And we're so glad to have partnered with them. Yeah, it goes to show, I mean, a couple of things that you mentioned, one being doing your homework as a founder, because you can look at, there's tools, uh, obviously like Crunchbase and like PitchBook to find investors, but even like signal.nfx.com is another one where people can find different investors, hear about them. I know like a lot of times you can do check on them by talking to their CEOs to be like, are they legit or not? And then like finding like GSV, for instance, I mean, yeah, ed tech. Uh, investors who have, I think, like seven unicorns now in their portfolio, and they're they're killer. Um, they're awesome. So that's like you can do that by doing your research as a founder to figure that out, um, which I think is really important. And the other thing you mentioned, which also I don't want to I want to highlight because I think it's important as well, is the idea of like engineering serendipity. So being on Twitter and these other types of things, being in the venture side of it now for me, I I see how much we use Twitter and VCs use Twitter even more than I ever thought before. And deals get done through Twitter and they get found through Twitter. And as a founder, you mentioned the one tweet a day, like that little investment of a tweet a day can engineer serendipity to get another investor that could put hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars into your company. So it's like, why wouldn't you take that chance at least to like give yourself the possibility of finding that, which is why I think posting that content is so vital and can be so important for founders to do. Right? The ROI of just a few lines of text, like I, I can't even believe it. And I, 
I think I think you're right. Like founders don't realize that basically every investor is on on Twitter. Like they are there, and even if they're not active, they're watching. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. They're, they're they're definitely watching, regardless of them posting or not. They're watching it, and I see that you know people have found us and pitched us, DM'd us through Twitter, and it's like great. We're we're open to that for sure. And as you see this world kind of shifting towards that, and people accepting that, like they pitch more and more, and more investors are not requiring a warm intro. They're allowing you to pitch them cold through Twitter, through whatever platform, you're just emailing them, whatever. And that's going to, I think, continue because it, if you want to have an advantage on the investor side, like you have to be open. Otherwise, you're going to miss out on some things that could truly be gems, um, which I think is important for founders to kind of understand that as you're, as you're building your company and, and thinking about who you're going to pitch and everything too, it's like, yeah, shoot your shot. <laughs> try, try for any company. Really? Cold emails, cold DMs, like you got to, you got to try. And if that doesn't work, like, try another way or maybe a different partner or try to work a, a founder or a founder you know that's on their portfolio but cold emails and cold dms are really magical yes absolutely for for more reasons than one and one thing i'll go back to as well with the distribution side i know you mentioned organic word of mouth you've done tremendously like i said and you're 50 000 plus users at this point as well let's talk more about the own the word campaign how that came about and what that kind of consists of for people Yep. So that definitely um, plays to our strength on partnerships distribution. So we were looking at our product and there is a bunch of these words and phrases across of it. And we're like, wow, this is almost a partnership playground. If we give a piece of a dictionary to not just our users, but companies and brands that might want to own these words. Um, so if you see coffee, it may be translated in Linus Cafe, you hover over it, you see Morning Brew Newsletter owns it. Like that's not only super fun, but we can also give a link to Morning Brew Newsletter that they can share across social that they now own the word coffee, which is a really fun thing to say for someone, uh, whether it's an individual person, a user, or also a company. And that gives Toucan even more eyeballs. Um, but I think what's important to note is our team has very much like a experimentation before we commit, like small tests before we dive in with engineering resources. And so when we first launched Own the Word, it was completely manual. We had a Google form that people can input, like what word they want. And then I had people Venmoing me own words and phrases so i had top tier series a investors venmoing me the nba venmoing me like all these crazy brands and individuals were on my personal venmo and then on the back end when we launched it we were scrambling to create these landing pages to make it look seamless even though we hadn't yet put in the engineering resources but even that day and that week we're like this is big for us and so we like, okay, test successful. Let's put in the engineering resources to automate it. On that note with, with testing, and that's something yeah, I think we've heard a lot about from, from startup world in general, of like A-B tests and testing different things out. And Are there any examples that are, I mean, it's pretty relatively new company in the last two years here, but any examples of tests that like really failed or like why they failed or things that just didn't go well or things that you're like, why they didn't go well or why you decide to move on from that? Because I think that's, just as important as, in, as testing is like how to decide to stop something. Even when someone has a company, it's like, when do you decide to quit? Any examples that come to mind for you, Taylor, around that too? Yeah, for sure. We're testing all the time. Um, the most obvious one for me is we have this big vision for Toucan, right? Meet people wherever they are, whether that's web, mobile, physical world, you name it as well as different content verticals. Like we're laser focused on languages right now, but we think our tech and we want our tech to eventually help you learn history or science or math or venture capital lingo, sports trivia, you name it, whatever you want to learn, we want to help you learn. Um, and very early on, we were trying to go after our big vision really early and we had limited resources, a really small team. And we realized that we actually need to like, focus and take a step back and double down on one content vertical, really nail it and focus there before we start expanding. And I think early stage founders tend to like want to go after the big vision or want to do everything at once, but being really mindful and honest and ruthless with yourself and also your team on what do you want to focus on right now and then double down on that. 
Yeah, that's that's so important, and that's uh, something that a lot of founders have mentioned to me previously. Who I've interviewed is around that focus, and just the more you can be laser focused around what you're doing and what makes you stand out, then you can expand from there as you grow, as you get more users, and everything from there. And and with that as well, so understand that you obviously want to be focused now, but there's this massive, massive vision you have for the future. What is it that helps you decide on what will be next, how you prioritize? Because again, we're trying to talk about this a little bit already with different channels, but I'm curious, like in general with the things you're doing and want to expand this massive vision you have, what goes into that prioritizing in terms of that roadmap for you guys then? Yeah. So we're actually in the midst of doing all of this right now too. Even with the focus on languages, there's still so many things we have to prioritize, right? Because we could launch Safari. We could internationalize to can launch our languages back to English, Firefox, like new platforms, new languages, launch Mandarin, you name it, as well as like feature iteration. And so we internally, each of our tickets, um, tickets meaning on Jira, how we're like defining bugs or features, we have a, a rating system based off of three different categories. So ease, confidence, and impact. Um, we let the team rate them around up to five each. And so it could be a 15 total. And then we use that to prioritize, okay, what's next? What are our big swings, but also what bugs are we fitting into this as well as features and just trying to juggle everything. But we also keep it really fluid. Um, so we're revisiting it every single week. Um, and it's not something that stays stale. We don't look at it for six months and we'll stay on the same product roadmap because we set it and that's how it has to be. Like we're always changing it and updating it based off of priorities. Yeah, I was talking to, uh, so I talked to Tara a while ago from Dig Labs and also Jess, her co-founder from Dig Labs, and they have this backlog that they constantly, they can see this backlog constantly and they're always chipping away and prioritizing every week. Every Monday, they come back to the backlog, like, are these the priorities or not? And they readjust and rejigger some things up and then they get do it again and the backlog keeps growing and then things keep shifting and that's how they continue to operate. And when I talked to Tara the first time, that was probably six to 12 months ago and then talked to Jess more recently, it's like, yeah, we're doing the same thing. We're just executing. There's a different backlog. And I think that process orientation, like how you go through that, it just helps you so much when there's so many different things going on and there's always new opportunities that come in that may change what you have to prioritize and having a system or a process in place for doing that is just so helpful to build your company, it seems like. It's really important. And, and one of the things as we kind of wrap things up here, um, I wanted to ask, because you're obviously in an educational company as well. What do you think the future of learning looks like? Obviously, Toucan's using the browser and, and web here, but what does the future of learning look like? I'll just leave it open like that. <laughs> so... What we're, we're leaning into it, also what I'm really excited, hopefully more and more um, companies and just people are building for is like building for people as humans, right? Like not just as um, an educator or a student or like the classroom as we know it, right? Um, it's what a lot of people did when we look at apps or website, like let's digitize the classroom. Like great as we have technology, but actually like people are living and it's really hard to set time aside to do that. Um, and that's why we see terrible retention rates and terrible engagement rates across ed tech companies, which is really sad. Um, it's great that they're making money because people pay up front and want to, they have high intent and hopes, and then they don't actually use the product which I think is a massive loss. It's, it's great revenue for the company, but the ripple effects don't really make a difference at the end of the day. And so what I'm really hopeful for companies to be thinking about the future is like, how do we get people to learn? Like creating amazing content, but getting people to engage with it, like learn from it, use it, take like use it to their advantage and integrate it into their lives one day or another. Like there's so many interesting things for people to be able to learn, but like we need to find ways to meet them wherever they are. And there's probably way more creative ideas that we don't even know yet with technology advancing as fast as it is. But I think that shift in mindset is going to be really important. Yeah. And, and just to dive a little bit deeper on that, like you're obviously helping with the way you're meeting people where they are with Toucan and how you're going about things there. For other people and that are trying to improve education and make things more, especially in the online space as well, really trying to make things more interactive and more engaging, 
what things can help because not everyone, not everyone obviously has a, a browser extension, but is there anything else? Because that's as we're looking at Vitalize, like one of the things we want to do moving forward is help educate more investors and founders. And so to that point, it's like we want to help educate and help them learn. I'm always wondering how, how to go about that. And I would just love any any thoughts or feedback you have on how people can make learning more interactive or improve upon that as well. Um, so I would I would say like what I was mentioning, like look look where people are like, okay, you may not build a browser extension, but can you create a WhatsApp group or a text message that gets sent out every day? Or can you tweet things because people are opening Twitter? You know, that they're going to read it or TikTok. These like different places that people are where we know that they're consuming content. Um, can we do that instead? And also more in bite size that then hopefully then they leverage off of that to go deeper into something else, right? It's like one of the things that we love about Toucan at Toucan is like all the partners we can work with. Because if you are taking time out of your day, that's great. And we can work with them. Um, but you need to start somewhere to kind of get someone interested in that topic or educated in that way or whatever you're trying to convey over to the consumer before they they dive deeper at that first lunge. Yeah, which is which is why I think Toucan is, is so great. And that I think of like the top of funnel and most of like you're starting with that. But like you said, your vision for Toucan is so big with what you want to do educationally, but you'll have that foothold and stronghold of where people are already. And like you can start with that top top funnel almost type of thing. And then even like what you mentioned with Twitter and kind of the bite-sized content, it's like those clips and those little things, those tweets, that's the start. And then a lot of times people end up going into a newsletter or then they go to like an online course or something engaging or a cohort-based course. You see some of those companies out now with like, like companies like Maven or something that try to do more education in that way. It's kind of fascinating to see how that leads into a deeper and deeper level where people can actually learn. And that's the actual, like, that's the point in the end is to help them learn. That's why, again, just to circle back. I just love what Toucan's doing for that reason. And and for you then, as we close things here, what other advice or anything else would you have for other founders, early stage founders um, that's been helpful, you know, in your journey that might be helpful for them as well? Um, I think taking the time to build relationships, whether that's with investors, with your team, with future team members, um, customers, users, that takes time and effort. And when we're all going so fast, it almost feels like, uh, should I be doing this? Why not? But we're all humans at the end of the day. And this isn't all just transactions and it shouldn't be. Um, and you should be building those relationships because it also shows you who, who you want to work with, right? And even if you look at your cap table, like we intend to make all of our investors a lot of money. Right. And like we want to make sure there's good ripple effects in the world with that. And so in order to figure out who might be able to do that, it takes time to build those relationships with people and see who we want to work with, um, even team members, too. Like when you're so early, it's so important bringing on um, team members that like add to the culture and that also are not toxic in one way or another. But you're not going to necessarily figure that out just from one interview right off the bat. Yeah, I love that. And, and Taylor, where can people go to find Toucan, learn more about Toucan, start with Toucan, and also connect with you if they would like to? Yes. So you can download Toucan at jointoucan.com right there. And then I am on Twitter. So at Taylor, T-O-I-L-O-R underscore Neiman, N-I-E-M-A-N. Perfect. Taylor, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Of course. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for listening too.